to the Health and Wellness Show, where we survive and thrive in a world of chaos. Dr. Danielle, a holistic and naturopathic doctor, and myself, Rhonda Wine, are your presenters today. Today, we have an amazing guest speaker with us, Dr. Jay Sordian. And just so you know, the mission of this group is to support the health and wellness of communities across the globe. And now I'd like to introduce the other presenter, Dr. Danielle. She goes by Dr. D. Dr. D is a very special lady, holistic and naturopathic doctor. She has a big heart for helping people. She's overcome some obstacles in life that most people wouldn't be able to handle. Please welcome Dr. D. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, through having problems with depression and cancer and uh, weight, and even having been thrown in jail, uh, for something I had not done, I developed different uh, techniques and strategies to survive and eventually thrive. And right now I specialize in specific nutrition and also in trauma therapy. And today I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Sordian, who's been in clinical practice for 40 years, but he's been involved in uh, natural medicine approaches for over 50 years. He's the author of two best-selling books on the brain and has been invited in dozens of television talk shows as a medical expert on avoiding Alzheimer's. You can find his books online at Amazon and his TV appearances on YouTube by searching under his name, Dr. J. Sorian, and it's spelled S-O-R-D-E-A-N, and by adding a city name like Chicago, Portland, or New York. Welcome, Dr. J. Thank you so much, Dr. D and Ron, Rhonda. 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 I always get confused. The beautiful spelling of your name always confuses me. I'm very visually oriented. So um, today I would like to speak uh, to the community. The, part of my mission is to prevent a million cases of Alzheimer's. And so today I, I'm very honored to be able to speak a little bit about things that you can do to help avoid Alzheimer's and dementia. Again, dementia is a big umbrella category of diseases, and Alzheimer's is one of those categories, but it consumes about 70% of the cases of, of dementia. There's alcoholic dementia also. Um, but at any rate, so we're going to kind of combine those in, uh, together in speaking about this today. So um, I have something called my brain wealth process. And it's three simple steps where we detect, we, di we discover what's going on as far as one of the 12 underlying causes that may be causing your brain and your nerve cells to be damaged and being killed off over time. And then we design a program that's going to address those underlying causes. And then we deliver you with a much more vibrant and a transformative experience in your life so that you are not bound and you are not um, captured by this degenerative process potentially. So um, this is a picture of the 12 spokes of the brain wealth process. And so I'm just, today we don't have a lot of time but and you can always apply to be part of my facebook page brain wealth longevity and get more information more detailed information but today we're going to touch upon uh, a few of the different part spokes of this wheel um, we're going to talk a little bit about heavy metal toxicity uh, and chemical toxicity and we're going to talk a little bit about sugar and we're going to talk about meningeal compression. So one of the things I'd like to start out with is just describing a little bit about the results that you can get from this process. Because I've seen many, many, many patients who have had um, all kinds of problems, brain fog, chronic fatigue. And these are some of the symptoms that ultimately are associated with Alzheimer's and dementia. It doesn't mean that you're developing it, but it, it could be. And so one of the things that I've helped people 
do is to get greater clarity of mind when they are stuck in a state of brain fog where things are just all fuzzy and not working right. Um, I've helped people who have chronic fatigue and um, where their body is just aching and not working well to reverse that as well. And that chronic fatigue and fatigue is one of the signs are symptoms of dementia and Alzheimer's when it has progressed a long distance. Sleep is also an issue. It's very important to get good sleep. And if you don't get sufficient sleep, you can be fatigued throughout the day. And lack of sleep is one of the uh, primary conditions that people who have Alzheimer's actually have. It's very difficult for them to sleep. Um, I've also worked with individuals who have uh, brain degeneration and Parkinson's where you don't have control over your body anymore. And I believe in a previous episode of this program, I talked about taking a shower and the difficulties of mm -hmm. a, an individual actually finding his way out of the shower. Uh, so I, I, I'm not going to go into that in depth today, but you can go back and rewatch that episode because it has a lot of other really fantastic information in it. So be sure that you're looking back at the other episodes of the health and wellness program because the health and wellness show, uh, because there's a lot, a lot packed in to this program that is really going to be helpful for you. Um, another result is actually saving money. I have a friend whose mother is in, has mild cognitive deficit, which is the step official step right before you get officially Alzheimer's. But, but, um, she thinks that there is a man wandering around in her basement all the time. And um, I actually went over, helped out, do some handyman things for her. And I checked carefully. There's no evidence of that. I made sure everything was locked up. But she still thinks somebody is wandering around. So there's this, this problem, this, this hallucination process that's going on with her. And because of this, it's not really safe for her to stay at home. And it's really expensive to have someone go into a, a memory care facility and it's also difficult to get them to go so this particular woman is refusing to go it's a little early for that and it's really expensive on the average if you develop alzheimer's the cost of care between when you go into the institution and when you actually pass is half a million dollars $500,000. Now, some of you in the audience may already have that saved up in retirement, or perhaps you've already got that in your legacy fund that you want to pass on to your children or grandchildren or even great grandchildren. That can be wiped out if you do not take action now to reverse the brain degeneration and killing of nerve and brain cells that is going on right now. It doesn't matter who you are, you, you may not feel it. But in actuality, it is going on right now in all of this because of the toxic environment that we live in. And if you start to develop the symptoms and the dysfunction of Alzheimer's and dementia, then your, your brain ability to think and to remember is really severely influenced. And if you, some people want to retire, some people, they say, okay, 65, that's it, 62. Well, I mean, there are some people who've put it together quickly enough, and they've actually retired at age 32 or 35. I cannot confess that that is my situation. Um, I sometimes kid people that I would like to be a trust fund baby. Um, I wasn't, and I don't think I ever will be a trust fund baby. But I would love to be able to just do everything that I want. But I really love helping people avoid dementia and Alzheimer's, and so that's why I'm here today. I can do that because my facilities are still very alert. I still have great memory and I've done a lot of things to help avoid dementia and the breakdown of the brain over the past 40 years. And so I'm quite confident that I will not develop dementia or Alzheimer's if I continue with these processes. So let's talk very briefly. Now I mentioned something about symptoms. You know, a lot of people feel that if you don't have symptoms, nothing is going wrong. Well, if you have a car and the oil light comes on, it flashes. Does that mean that 
the oil, you can just keep driving for as long as you want. No, it means that the oil level has actually been going down, 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 down until it gets to a critical level. And so symptoms are actually the last stage of dysfunction. We start out with high level functioning. Our body is working well. And when we have high level function, we have a sense of ease in life. Everything is easy. We can walk around. We don't have pain. We, we can think clearly. We sleep well. Our digestion is good if we're in high functioning. However, because of a variety of things, toxicity, stress, traumas, and it can be any kind of trauma, those are three primary reasons why our function starts to break down. That can decrease our blood flow, that can decrease the hormones and disrupt hormones in our body. And what happens is that we start to develop stagnation. So I have a little chart here, and you can see here, I've got, this is just a very small, example of the back pages of a lot of patients you know i've stored up patient files for like 25 years and so i have to go through them because i don't have enough space for them and so i have to rip them apart and so but i like to keep certain parts of, for reference so this is a chart that i've used for many 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 people and you can see up here this this is normal processing normal um here you can have a sense of ease if there's no stagnation nothing going on here but if you have trauma, stress, or toxicity, you'll get a blockage. And then that starts to decrease your function. So you start to have dysfunction. Once you've lost 40% of, because of stagnation, your body starts to degenerate and you start to have dysfunction. Then that ease turns into disease as the function decreases even more. And that by then, that is you have you're down to like 40 or 50% functioning. Once you've gotten down to another, like 40% left, that is when symptoms develop. So most people come in with symptoms. So does that mean that they're functioning at a high level? No. It means that they're only functioning at about 40% of their potential. So this is why you want to avoid, you want to deal mm -hmm. with these underlying stagnations so it does not progress down into the disease and then the symptoms, just like your car. Um, you wanna make sure you take care of the car. Uh, maybe you don't have, you know, pretty soon, oil in your engine is gonna be irrelevant because it's all gonna be electric cars, right? But for now, those of us who live in the petroleum era um, have to put oil in our car to make sure it works right. So that's just an example. So I wanna just go over that briefly because a lot of people don't understand what functional medicine is, is and why we want to capture things sooner than when we develop symptoms because a lot of people say, hey, my memory's great, nothing's wrong. Why do I need to do anything? Well, there are a lot of different ways that we can detect whether or not you are having some functional issue. And so let's talk a brief moment here about toxicity. So here on the chart again, toxicity is like here, heavy metal toxicity. For example, mercury, um, lead, other heavy metals can accumulate in your body and cause massive disruption of hormone systems and your brain. We can also have chemical toxicity. We live in a very chemical heavy environment. Over the past hundred years or so, human ingenuity has created hundreds of thousands of new chemicals that never existed before. And a minute fraction, I mean, it's just like maybe the tip of my fingertip compared to my whole body. If my whole body was all the chemicals in the world now, maybe the tip of my fingertip have been tested for safety and mm -hmm. health effects. And of those, many have not been healthy. So we don't really know the impact of all these new chemicals and our body for sure never, ever got exposed to these in the past because they didn't exist. So these are new foreign elements. And when our body sees these, oftentimes they're toxic or they create an inflammatory reaction. Most of them are fat soluble, like pesticides, herbicides. And those fat soluble items have to be cleared by the liver. And the liver has a long to-do list and it can't get around to everything. So what happens, it does, it says, well, it's fat soluble. So the body says, let's, let's not store it in the brain, even though there's a lot of fat in the brain. Let's not store it in our earlobe or whatever. Let's just put it in fat. This is what five pounds of fat is like. 
I mean, when I'm on television and you should see it, you can see it a little better, but I hand this to the other person, the, the person I'm speaking to, and they go, ooh, this is so disgusting. Well, actually, this is actually real fat. This is, um, it's a petroleum byproduct. One of my patients told me years ago that um, they used to work in Texas, and they used to go inside these big tankers, uh, oil tank, tank cars, and they had to scoop out this yellow gunk out of the bottom because it settles the bottom. And I think that's what this is. So, ooh, it stinks. It's really, it's, it's vile. So I always have to wash my hands. And I, I, you know, I put it in like several layers of plastic and I hide it away in a corner so it doesn't disperse into my air. But this is real fat and it smells bad because toxins are stored in it because it's fat soluble. So a lot of people, their weight problems are actually due to toxicity being stored in their fat cells because they are not, they don't have all the components necessary to clear it out of the body. And so I know Dr. Uh, D also works with toxicity. And so what kind of things do you actually do uh, with people? Do you add uh, supplements or do you do some special regimen? I do have some special homeopathics to detox deep. And I check what people are eating, put them on a good diet for themselves. And okay. uh, yeah, and also deal with trauma mostly. That makes a lot of sense to me. And, and one of the things with toxicity, there's a couple of key things. Number one, eat as organically as you can afford yep. because you don't want to get all this pesticide and chemicals. So I know it's expensive, but it's actually when you're putting it in your body as organic, then you have fewer of those chemicals and you don't have to spend as much time and money to actually support your body in clearing them out. So that's a big savings in money. So it may, it may seem like it's a little expensive, but in the long run, compared to half a million dollars to deal with Alzheimer's, it is a, well, uh, is a great investment organically. Also, I believe it's very important to filter your water. Now, I've always supported multi-pure filtration systems. They have a carbon block filter that's researched independent labs. And there's a, I don't know, there's a list of 500 different chemicals it removes. Um, so I recommend multi-pure and, and I'd be happy to give you more information about that. I've been using those for about 40 years since I first heard about them here in when I moved to California and I use them in my clinic. Every clinic I've ever been in, we put it in. Uh, I use it in my homes with my daughters, myself. And, you know, I've got some gray hairs for sure. I've got gray hairs and I watch for that, but I'm 67 right now. And a lot of people my age actually have a lot of more gray hairs than I partially attribute the fact that my hair is not graying as quickly uh, due to the fact that I use multi-pure water for probably 80% of my um, intake of water. There's obviously, if I go out to restaurants, not, well, I can't do it right now, we're all sheltering in place, but a lot of the restaurants uh, do not use filtered water. Um, there are other places that don't use filtered water. So in the external environment, I am exposed to non-filtered water. But um, I'd say 80% of what I do put into my body, and again, 70% of our body is, is water. And uh, a program recently said, I don't know if it's true or not, but maybe 80% of our brain is water. So water is a key element in keeping your body healthy, and you need a sufficient amount of water to actually flush out the chemicals from your body, once they have been changed from fat soluble to water soluble, so you can pee them out, poop them out, sweat them out, cry them out, or spit them out, which is how we get toxins out of the body once they get in. And the liver has to switch them so it can go into water more easily. So um, let's talk briefly about sugar imbalances. How are we doing for time? We're doing just fine. Go ahead. It's fascinating. Okay. So. Here's my little chart again, and sugar imbalances are right here. One thing I forgot to mention as far as toxicity is there's a couple tests that we actually do to see if you have chemical or heavy metal toxicity. And on my Facebook group, we have a few different levels of subscription people can do. And at the higher level, of subscription, we actually do the urine test to see if you have heavy metals not being taken out of the body properly. And we also um, do a test, there's a bioimpedance analysis test, which tests for chemical clogging up your system and sucking water out of your cells into the bloodstream. 
So uh, that's a couple of ways we can detect it. There's also some other uh, lab tests that can be done to test for a variety of different chemicals that could be in your body. I try to go the, the most economical way as possible first, and those other tests are simple to do. They're non-invasive. We don't have to draw any blood or anything. So uh, that's the heavy metal. So when we're talking about blood sugar, I would imagine almost everyone here has gone and had blood taken with a fasting blood test. And you're fasting, and so we can see if your levels of sugar go up too high, circulating in your bloodstream. It should not be too high because sugar, you know, I don't know about you, but I actually like the taste of sugar. Now, I was brought up on sugary things, and so it could be partly that. Um, my daughter's brought up much more responsibly, I must say, um, partly due to me and probably more in part to their mother. But sugar is actually a necessary item for our nutrition because if we eat carbohydrates, they're broken down into more simple sugars and simple, simple sugars are what we burn for energy. I don't know if you've gone into any restaurants or any other health facilities. Like I, I got tested for the COVID-19 like a couple of weeks ago. It's negative. But I went in and, you know, they take that little thermometer thing and they either touch it to your head. And in my clinic, I do that as well for all the patients coming in uh, for, their, for their reassurance. Um, but either touch it there or it's like, you know, it's a little infrared ray that measures the temperature. We all have, have to have a certain body temperature for all the chemical reactions in our body to work right. If it's too slow, like cryotherapy, ever heard of like cryonics where people, uh, they, they die and they go into suspended animation with, they're frozen because that slows down all the chemical processes to like a standstill essentially. So we have to have a certain temperature for our bodies to work right. Just like if you're baking bread, it has to go up to a certain temperature for it to bake. If it's too low, it, it comes out kind of, you know, doughy. You can still eat it, but it's not as easily eaten and not as well digested. If you're able to eat bread or if you aren't gluten intolerant. But at any rate, our body has to have a certain temperature to operate. And there's a certain range at which the body operates best. The temperature where the chemical reactions occur most properly. And sugar is one of those things that we burn. We actually burn it. I don't know if you've ever had a marshmallow. You've gone out uh, camping and you put a marshmallow over the campfire. Really fun, I think. But then, you know, I'm, I'm kind of impatient. I would just stick it on in the fire, stick it in the fire and let it catch on fire. And then <laughs> it would turn black. You know, maybe I, maybe I pull the black part off. Maybe I wouldn't. But you shouldn't eat the black part. That, that's charred sugar. But essentially, marshmallows are just sugar in a different form so it burns it actually burns but that's really hot on that on that fire you put your hand over there ah you know you can burn your hand so all these things have to be a controlled burning of sugar so we do need sugar but too much sugar causes all kinds of problems alzheimer's one particular type of alzheimer's is associated directly with sugar and it's called type 3 diabetes so it's a very clear connection between blood sugar and the development of dementia and Alzheimer's. And, and people who have diabetes, they will often have these periods where they just don't recognize anyone. They don't know who people are coming in. And when their blood sugar's off, it disequilibrates the functioning of the brain. And so those cognitive functions are decreased or, or totally eliminated. So we know that Sugar imbalance is a key thing that you need to control. You need to really do a properly balanced diet um, like Dr. D and myself do in order to make sure your blood sugar levels are even and that will help you avoid the foundational causes of Alzheimer's and dementia. And so doing blood tests is one way that we uh, test for that. And we can go into more detail online. I have, I have done lots of lectures on a lot of subjects on diabetes, blood sugar imbalances. And if you put my name in and you put in diabetes, I think I have several lectures that are online on YouTube. They go into much more detail about what diabetes is and insulin and insulin resistance, things of that nature. So the third thing here, I want to briefly discuss how we doing with time. We're doing good. 
Go ahead. So the third thing I want to discuss is stress <laughs> because stress is a huge component that can alter your brain function and overall your bodily function. You all know uh, that some stress is really important. Um, if we weren't stressed a little bit, we might not be motivated to actually get a lot of things done. At least that's the way I am. But there's a difference between having a stress reaction and a stress response. So what we would like to do is respond more to external events so that it's a little cooler, it's a little more rational, and it doesn't eat up your body's energy. Whereas if you're just reacting all the time, you're like this, this, you're all tense. That's like anxiety reactions, panic attacks, things of that nature. Very, very, very bad for your body. And it also kicks up the inflammation in your system, as does diabetes and blood sugar imbalances. So the brain actually gets more inflamed if the blood sugar levels are off. And if we're under stress, that causes a lot of imbalances in our body as well. And it helps to set up the conditions for brain and nerve cell degeneration and death. So stress is one of those items that I also evaluate with each person who comes in as a part of the brain wealth program. So again, stress we have up here. And we got sugar here. Inflammation's over here. We didn't mention that yet. The inflammation is a key component related to sugar, related to stress, related to chemical toxicity, related to heavy metal toxicity. We aren't going to talk about food allergies, but if you're allergic to food or sensitive to the foods you put in your body, you get an allergic reaction, and that can then end up influencing what's called the gut-brain axis. And you can get inflammation in your brain if your intestines are inflamed because your body is fighting the foods that are coming into your body. So when we're doing stress and in the Facebook group, I have one of the levels of, of the subscription also does an evaluation of stress. So it's a survey, but we also do at a higher level, there are ways to measure the stress hormones in your body by getting a sample of your saliva four times during the day. And so this is an example of one of those tests that I did with somebody. And you can see here, this green zone is where the levels of cortisol should be throughout the day. When we wake up in the morning, we have a lot of cortisol. And melatonin, as you know, melatonin and cortisol are reciprocal. So as cortisol goes down, melatonin goes up. And what's melatonin for? That's right, it helps you sleep. Some people take it when they're, when they're um, flying uh, to help to reset their circadian rhythm uh, if they're getting jet lag. But melatonin goes up when cortisol goes down. And so cortisol should go start up in the morning and that helps us wake up. We wake up because we have so much cortisol in our system. And then it starts to drift down during the day and it should be low enough so that melatonin can then help us fall asleep. Well, this is a very extraordinary example of one of these tests. And you can see here, there are dots right across there. They should be down here but they were across here. This was like a really unusual finding in this person. And the laboratory said, you know, something's weird. Is this person actually taking uh, glucocortisone or cortisone or anything like that? Because that would keep the cortisone levels up very high. And so uh, we did a retest and yet, the levels were still on the upper level of that green zone. And you can see here, when it should have dropped, it was higher than where it should have been. This was one of the reasons this person had sleep problems was because their cortisol levels were too high. So this is one of the tests that we do in the office to test for the stress response related to cortisol and other hormones in the body. So this is, so 
the three-step process is discover. And so this is one way to discover what hormones may be out of balance related to stress and the adrenal function. Then based on this result, we would design the program that would address that particular issue and the others that are going on in the 12 steps. And this isn't like the AA 12 step program. This is just a little bit different. I, I made it 12 steps because we have 12 fingers and 12 toes, right? No, no, I'm just <laughs> messing with you a little bit. I just wanna see if you're still awake. We have five fingers on each hand, five toes. Some of us have a few more, some of us have a few less. But um, it's also one of the reasons why we, we have 10 numbers, why we created 10 numbers for our, our um, primary mathematical systems is because we can count on our fingers, right? So this base 10 is based on the fact that our, we're physiologically have 10 digits. If we are Martians and only had three, we might actually be base three. And as you know, computers are base two. They're digital, just two. Yes, so it's on off switches, so that's base two. Anyway, a, a slight divergence there. But now the last thing I would like to mention is something called the meninges. Now, not everyone knows what the meninges are. I think most people have heard of meningitis. And that's the inflammation of these little membranes that surround the brain and the spinal cord. So I'm bringing out my little brain example here. This is a brain. It's a plastic brain. I don't know if maybe, uh, maybe that's better. It's better. And so what I did, this is not actually a spinal cord. This is just a rope that I stuck up inside the brain as an example. But then I wrapped all this saran wrap or a plastic wrap around the spinal cord and around this side of the brain to illustrate the fact that we have these membranes that help protect the brain, but also all of our blood flow and all our, our cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid particularly to the central nervous system. It flows through there. If this gets twisted or torqued, it can be because of, of, of injuries to the head. It can be because we had a whiplash injury. And there's a lot of different reasons. We could have inflammation somewhere in our body. When the meninges get twisted or torqued, it cuts off the flow of blood, it cut, cuts off the flow of cerebral spinal fluid, and it creates an actual irritation to the nerves where they're firing, and they shouldn't be firing because it's just like irritating. It's kind of like, you know, I don't know if, if your parents, I know that Dr. D's parent, and how many, how many children do you have? Seven. <laughs> Seven, that's a lot. So, and... Are they all, I know, I know some of them throw knives and do all these other kind of very interesting things. Very unique family you've got there. Um, my daughter's not learning to throw knives yet. Um, hatchets, yes. Yeah, uh, they do hatchets too. They do, they do ha hatchets and javelins, things like that. But no, I'm just joking. But, um, and Rhonda, do you have children? No, okay. Maybe you have nieces and nephews? I definitely have nieces and nephews. Okay. So one of the things, you know, when they're trying to get your attention, they'll grab on clothes. They'll go, uh, uh, hey, 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 hey. They'll grab your pants, your shirt, whatever. They're trying to get your attention. And that's what happens when the meninges are out of, out of whack. They just keep going, eh, 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 eh. They, and they shouldn't be. I mean, kids can do that. They want your attention. Once they have your attention, then that irritation disappears. But just imagine if you have nerves in your body that are, are – firing, firing off, and they shouldn't be. That's going to create a lot of problems, but it also can create a decrease in flow of, of blood circulation to your brain. If you've ever worn a tie that was too tight or a collar that's too tight, I didn't, I've sort of outgrown this collar, uh, too tight, then it's going to block the flow of blood to your brain and a lack of blood flow to your brain, bad circulation is never good for the brain or other parts of the body. It caused that in and of itself can cause degeneration of the brain cells and the nerve cells. So that is one of the things I checked to see if there's meningeal compression. Once again, this is something that a very extremely small percentage of doctors have ever checked, let alone been trained in. So this is why I consider it a very key part of my brain wealth process and a very unique aspect of it. So exercise is very important for circulation. And in my Facebook group, I have a series of exercises 
where you're moving your head back and forth, all the different directions, this way, that way. All of our joints need to be exercised to their full range. So I go through a series of those exercises, as well as an exercise that I learned when I was in Japan. I read, write, and speak Japanese. And um, I studied Tai Chi when I was 18 in college. And so this is one of the exercises that people, some people learn, it's called Ritsu Zen. Ritsu is standing and Zen is like Zen meditation. So it's a standing Zen meditation. And I described that in my Facebook group and, and show a demonstration. And it's one of the exercises I consider to be really, really helpful. It takes very little space to do, but it actually, because you're rotating, you're actually getting some good action on the vertebra and your spinal, spinal cord and this, your whole spine and your neck. And so it helps to work and unkink some of the meningeal compressions that may develop over time just because you're under stress. So that's about the meninges. And I think perhaps that's all we have time. I think it's a little overload for you, perhaps. But I want to remind you that we do have a Facebook group called Brain, Wealth, and Longevity. And a number of these exercises and other bits of information about this you can find there. So I would encourage you to join and apply to join that group. It's Brain, Wealth, and Longevity. And I encourage you to watch the other episodes of the H&W Show because we're all here to help each other in this community. We're all here to help improve the health of everyone because if we're all healthy, it's a better world. So uh, any other questions or anything you might have there? Well, I have a, a comment and maybe a question. Excellent. <laughs> a comment is we're starting to read that Alzheimer doesn't start when you are old. It starts 20 to 30 years earlier. So I was really happy when you talked about going from ease to disease and that people need to take care of their health not when everything is critical, when you, know, you don't have oil and your engine is screaming, you take care of your health and you do the, main, the regular maintenance. I tell my clients that the body is a high performance vehicle, but we don't treat it that way. So I love that. And uh, yeah, you wanna comment more about you know, starting early? Even as children need to be taught proper nutrition and detox. I agree with you, Dr. D, a thousand percent. The, there were studies that were done by the Environmental Working Group, and they tested umbilical cord blood of 250 children. And they were testing for chemical toxicity. And I think 90% of the blood samples had some degree, up to 25, 30, maybe 50% even or 80% of the chemicals they tested were found in the umbilical cord blood of newborns. So we all live in this new environment. And it is not only is it an incredible place, nature, beautiful water, none of the waters are really that pristine anymore. There's a lot of things that get evaporated up into the sky get into the rainwater and come back down and pollute the, the water. The air is not so clean. And even children are growing up in this same environment. And so this is why it's important to start early and do it often. Get checked often. Continually, it's a continued process, just like an automobile, electric car. You drive it away and then it runs out of energy. You got to plug it back in. We have to do the same thing with our body. We have to do this on an ongoing basis, eating properly, drinking filtered water, having positive thoughts, dealing with the traumas. I know that, that um, Dr. D has a lot of expertise in that and, and works with people. Um, and clients in a very sophisticated way with EFT and things of that nature that help to unclog. As, as things are building up, it's better to clear it out 
before it gets really impacted in there. And so what you do um, is a really wonderful thing. And that's why I agree a lot that the Alzheimer's Association says that most of the dysfunction, as we were talking about, little by little by little, the dysfunction, the brain degeneration, the, the damage and the killing of, of nerve cells occurs over approximately 20 years. But like I have a patient who is 24. It happened, bam, like that. And if we had not caught this toxicity, the food allergies and the meningeal compression early on, she would have, it would have taken her less than 20 years. She was already sleeping 18 hours a day, um, dependent on other people. And, you know, one of the things that happens is that relationships get destroyed by dementia and Alzheimer's. You can have the most incredibly warm, intimate relationship with someone. It could be a spouse. It doesn't have to be a spouse. It could be a best friend. And when they start developing Alzheimer's and dementia, that's cut off because they don't really know who you are. And their behavior can become quite irrational and quite extreme. Um, I know a number of friends who are going through this and uh, it's, it's really heartbreaking to see. I try to get down and visit one friend whose husband has uh, an aphasia, a progressive aphasia, which is where your speech centers are, are degenerating. But he's, he, there's other areas that are not doing so well. And for her, it's, she, has to, she worries about him all the time, afraid maybe he's gonna burn the house down, things of that nature. So it costs money to have other caretakers come in. Your own personal life is restricted. And it costs, you know, and, and so I think I mentioned the friend of mine whose mother, uh, it costs a thousand dollars a month just to have someone come in and sleep with her at night, just to stay with her overnight to make sure that when she wakes up, she doesn't like freak out and she doesn't like put the stove on and things of that nature. So that's 12 grand a year just to have someone stay overnight at the house. So relationships, personal relationships. Now there are some people whose relationships with their parents or loved ones were horrible. I mean, it started out really bad. And then if they are the ones left to care for them, the strain is even worse because already there's this little negativity going on or a lot. And then all of a sudden this person is not there and they act super irrational and they demand, they're demanding and this and that. And so, so, Anything you can do early on to help avoid Alzheimer's and dementia, like the steps that we mentioned here, um, I, I think it's a great thing to do. And uh, it serves humanity because we do not need to spend so much extra money on these kind of long-term chronic, chronic health issues when we may be able to prevent them early on and create a much more healthy and vibrant society and world. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate that very, very much. So just as a reminder to everyone, uh, the Health and Wellness Show, we support small businesses and entrepreneurs and people wanting to help others. So we promote incredible individuals that give skills, tips, services, advice, and just hope that, uh, that help people with their health and wellness. So we cover the emotional, physical, spiritual, mental, and financial aspects of being a human being. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the H&W show, please email Dr. D, um, Dr. D or myself at mentormedrd at gmail.com. And that's mentorme, all one word, and then followed by Dr. Dr. and then D at gmail.com. The other one is Stop the Junk Rhonda. And that's Stop the Junk, all one word, followed by Rhonda, R-O-N-D-E-A at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us. Love and peace to all.